Bible college, I got it from the Lord. I have no disparaging remarks about Bible college, about my organization. I love my superintendent, all of the men of God. But I understand that we can be in a bubble of thinking and that bubble can be a hindrance to our walk with God. And we've got to get in the book and we've got to hear from God so that we don't get all messed up because somebody down the road's got a bigger church than we got. Or they're having revival over there and we're not having revival and on and on and on. Folks, we all just need to learn how to walk with God. And revival's going to come. God don't love people in Wichita more than he loves us. God don't love people in Indianapolis, Indiana more than he loves us or anywhere else. And I got news for you. Some of these revivals ain't nothing but a swelling. No, I'm not going to talk about that because it's too deep for some of you. I don't want a swelling. I want a revival. I want real people to come in here and really want to live for God. Anyway, oh, praise God. Uh, there were men of God that uh, ha were in a bubble of thinking, and they couldn't, they couldn't think right. You know, I mean, it had to be a man like Moses that could see above the, the situation in the land of Egypt to be able to be used of God to get them people out of there. Because most of Israel really kind of had a slave mentality. They were in a bubble. And Moses was born outside the bubble. He was in the palace. And he wasn't intimidated by the aristocracy of the day. And he had the gall and audacity to walk in before the Pharaoh and said, God said to let my people go. And if you don't let them go, he's going to kill your firstborn son. Amen. Now, folks, that would take a lot of boldness to be able to do that. And Moses was able to pull off. It wasn't just Moses, you understand. But we've got to somehow realize that this thinking down here is counterproductive to our relationship with God. And your main problem in living for God is going to be to constantly quit thinking like the world thinks and think like God wants you to think. Your walk with God requires that you have a mind of God. You think like God thinks. Because discouragement is just too overwhelming sometimes. Discouragement is going to hit you head on like a freight train. No pun intended, Brother Jacob. Amen. Things are going to happen in life. You can be more concerned about what people think about you than what God thinks about you. You know, our desire to be popular. I'm sure nobody here has got that desire. Don't even know why I brought that up. It must be for somebody that didn't show up tonight. No, we all kind of want to get along. We all kind of want to look good. We all kind of have a desire to, you know, to, to, to be popular. And yet Jesus said, beware when all men speak well of you, because so did they to their false, to the false prophets. Jesus said, rejoice when all men speak bad about you, because that means your heavenly father, amen, is pleased with you. Do you want the, 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 the praise of men or the praise of God? What is more important to you, to be pleasing to God or to be pleasing to people? Your thinking is going to have to really uh, make a choice because you can't please both. And I'm hoping tonight that since you're here and you seem to want to live for God, it seems like the majority, maybe there's some here that are just playing mind games, I don't know. But it appears to me that the majority, if not all of the people in this building, wants to please God. If that is the case, then forget about pleasing everybody else. 
Forget about it. I'm not telling you to be obnoxious or unkind or self-righteous or snooty. Uh, try to be happy and get along with people on your job and your family and, and be nice and be cordial and uh, be courteous and all that other stuff. That's what a child of God is supposed to be doing. But when it comes right down to it, all your courtesy and all of your cordialness and all of your kindness and all of your etiquette is not going to make some people happy because they have a spirit in them that's different than the spirit that's in you. And that's why John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Why? Because the world will put you in, in an area where there's guidelines and parameters and you're not supposed to get out of those parameters. The world will do your thinking for you. I firmly believe that when Jesus comes, there's going to be such an amazing awakening of our minds. Because technology... The internet, Hollywood, all of that goes on that we entertain ourselves with has a gradual eroding of the things of God that God has placed in our minds. And while I'm not going to preach against the internet and I'm not going to preach against being in the world, but I am going to tell you, the more of the world you observe and the more of the world you know about, the more you're going to have to constantly get your mind straightened out from time to time if you're going to live for God. Now, you can go through the motions and pretend and, you know, just act like you're uh, living for God. But if you really, really want to really walk with the Lord, there's going to have to be some mental changes that take place in your heart and mind. <laughs> I've often thought about that scripture in the book of Isaiah, the 25th chapter and the 7th verse, where the Bible says that God will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all people. Nations. Do I need to say that again? Folks, there is a veil over all the nations. And there's a covering, a bubble, a group thinking, a mass consciousness over all people. And God wants to deliver us from that. Someday it's going to be destroyed. But right now, that's our main problem. I do believe it's our thinking that is our main problem. If you'll think on things that are lovely and pure and holy and good and right. I believe that's Philippians 4 and 6, Brother Joel. We got to think on things that are lovely and pure and holy and right and good. And 4 and 8. 4 and 8. Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? Next verse. What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You're not thinking about things lovely and pure and holy and just and of a good report when you're watching a shootout between a bunch of cowboys on a Hollywood movie, are you? Boy, that got some of you right there. We better stop. You're not thinking about things that are lovely whenever you're watching one guy double up his fist and hit somebody else in the face, are you? Oh, yes. Somebody said, well, Jesus took a cord of whip and he whooped them people over there in the temple so I ought to be able to do the same thing. That's kind of like when I was, uh, I was on the cruise. I was just walking around minding my own business, having a good time, and they were, I noticed they had little trays of 
of a, something. I didn't know what it was. And a lady come up to me and said, would you like to have some free champagne? I could have said, well, the Bible says drink a little wine for the stomach's sake. So, yeah, give it to me. But I didn't do that. You know, if you want to sin, you can probably find a scripture that maybe you can take out of context and you can, you can justify your sin. I said, no, ma'am, I've never tasted alcohol in my life and I don't want to start now. But that wasn't good enough. Another guy come up to me. I had... I'm telling you, if you go on a cruise, you better be ready for the devil to put a little something in front of you. You ought not to be there. Probably you ought to just catch a flight to, to uh, Flagstaff, Arizona and go walking through the Grand Canyon or something. Probably save a little money. Boy, that didn't go over very good. Hallelujah. But we need to Think about the praises that comes from God. Pleasing the Lord or pleasing people. Uh, Jesus made this amazing observation. It's in the book of John, the fifth chapter. It says in John, the fifth chapter, How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. These Pharisees, they really tried to impress one another. These Pharisees were really good at praying publicly. And when they fasted, you know, they were pretty good at disfiguring their face and making everybody think, boy, he's really holy and religious and good and all that stuff. And Jesus said, you're in a bubble. You need to get out of that way of thinking. Don't, don't think like the Pharisees think. Because they're always trying to honor one another. They're obsessed with being honored. And I love my United Pentecostal Church, and I don't ever want to say anything disparaging, but, you know, I wonder about these awards that they pass out, about, you know, if you give so much money, you get an award, you get a... I'm thinking, don't worry, I'm not going to change the United Pentecostal Church. I can't. But I think they ought to give an award to, <clears throat> to a man that goes through bad times and he, he, he keeps on living for God. Let's get off of that. <clears throat> I'm way over my head, folks. I was just really... Uh, Jesus was born in a Jewish society in a bubble of thinking that they're the only ones that's right. They're the only ones that's good. Everybody else is dogs. And yet Jesus was able to overcome that way of thinking. And he taught his followers to overcome that way of thinking. You know, I really feel sorry for children that are born in the inner city. And... Uh, they are taught by the thugs and the drug dealers and the people that have a bad way of looking at things. They're against the police. They really are against authority in our country. I feel sorry for those children. I feel sorry for people that have grown up and become adults that are surrounded by uh, the attitude that, you know, uh, we've got to look out for ourselves and we can't trust the police and we can't trust the government and we can't do this. And, you know, if you, if you grew up in that mentality, you need to get out of that and understand what's going on. I would like to see those kind of people get right with God and see them get out of that way of thinking. So what's your bubble tonight? <laughs> Amen. I thought about 
that verse of scripture. This really originated in the uh, second chapter of the book of Romans as I was reading it here a while back. And uh, it talked about circumcision of the heart, which is a process that takes place that really enables you to seek the praises of God more than the praise of men. That's exactly what Paul said in that chapter. Let's turn to the second chapter of the book of Romans. And I want to make this short tonight so there might be a little discussion. So get your questions ready if you have any. Uh, it says in Romans, the second chapter and the 26th, 28th verse, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter and this is the result whose praise is not of men but of God when you get your heart circumcised you're going to want the praises of God. You're going to want to please God more than you please people. If we have a people-pleasing spirit here tonight, I would like to get you off of that idea because that idea will take you to hell. You will be controlled by all kinds of people that are trying to manipulate you. It says in Romans, or excuse me, Galatians 1 and 10, for I, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please, to please men? For if I pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And then I got to thinking, who in the Bible did God praise? And boy, my computer really come alive. My computer in my mind. <laughs> I found all kind of people that the Lord said good things about. What did God say about Job? He's a man that fears God, issues evil, perfect and upright. Well, wouldn't that be something if God said that about you or me? Do you want God to say stuff like that about you? Well, maybe you better be upright. Maybe you better try your best to be perfect. What did God say about Abraham? There's three things that God said about Abraham, three places where God complimented Abraham. The book of Isaiah, I think the 40th chapter, 41st chapter, God said, he's my friend. My friend. That's where we get that song, I'm a friend of God. That's where Jesus evidently got that saying over there in the book of John where he said, I'm not going to call you servants anymore. I'm going to call you friends. But Genesis 18 and 19, God said that Abraham would command his children after him. Boy, God would command, for I know him, that he will Whoa, now that's kind of a rarity when we command our children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham. And then there was even a greater compliment that God gave Abraham in Genesis 26 and 5 where Abraham was not even alive and God was talking to his son Isaac. Genesis 26 and 5, because that Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. What a compliment. You know, that's what we should seek after more than anything else. What did God say about David? He's a man after my own heart. 
What did God say about Daniel? The angel said, Daniel, you are beloved in heaven. What a statement. You mean heaven knows about me? Yes. What did the devil say about Paul? He said, Jesus I know and Paul I know. Boy, that wasn't a very good compliment for those guys. Seven sons of Sceva. They got whooped by one man. How would you like it if one man whooped seven guys? You wouldn't be able to live that down. But God didn't know them. The devil didn't know them. They didn't have power. They were defeated. They were humiliated. They ran out of the house naked and wounded. But Paul didn't have that problem. He had a walk with God. He really wasn't concerned about what people said about him. He was concerned about what God thought about him. And you are going to. If you live for God, you are going to experience some unpopularity at times. You are going to experience some criticism at times. You are going to be a little unpopular. Now, can you handle it? Is it going to wreck your relationship with God? Are you going to throw in the towel? You know, last Sunday we, uh, we were having lunch and there was this lady that was just looking at us and she was just waving and, and I thought maybe she wasn't, I didn't recognize her at all. And, and finally I told my wife, I said, who is that over there? She's waving at us and we, I was waving back, you know, but I had no idea. Finally she gets up and she comes over there and she said, oh, brother and sister Khan, I haven't seen y'all in many, many years she said, you don't know who I am, do you? And she called her name, and all of a sudden, I just remembered who she was. And her mother, her mother brought her to church, her and her sisters and their dad. And uh, they drove in on Sunday morning. Uh, well, it wasn't real consistent, but, you know, they came on occasion. They weren't members of the church. They didn't really get in there and really uh, get close to God and become members of the church, and in a way, that's really tragic, you know, because, of course, she had aged something awful. At one time, she was, like the preacher said last Friday night, he said she was a woman very pleasing to the eyes. Well, folks, Alcohol and sin had damaged her face, and it's so sad. It's so sad because there's a ton of people that just come and they just really don't get in all the way. You know, for some reason, it just doesn't register that they've got to get in all the way without any reservations. I think about what one sister said. She's not here tonight. I don't know where Sister Edna's at, but bless her heart. Uh, I'm telling you, she came back from being out there in the world, and she said, Brother Khan, I've made up my mind. Everything that comes across that pulpit, I'm going to do it. Right. Where do you find people like that? got all kind of people that like to just come and sit, you know, and say, well, I'm a member, but I'm really not. I'm a member, but I'm not going to do everything that I'm told to do or suggested or preached. I'm, I, I'm, I'm here, but I really don't really, really want to uh, think like they think around. You know, this is a bubble right here. Did you folks know this is a bubble? We have some group thinking around here, don't we? We're all kind of thinking that we all got to be baptized in Jesus' name and get the Holy Ghost, live holy, amen, and walk with God and be in church and all that good stuff. But you know, I've noticed if people miss church for about two weeks, they get to, they lose the, the thinking. You got to constantly be reminded 
or uh, you'll wind up in another kind of way of thinking that's not going to be pleasing to the Lord. Are you in the fold or are you not in the fold? Are you connected to the vine or are you not connected to the vine? Are you producing fruit in the kingdom of God or are you just kind of going through the motions and pretending? It would behoove everybody in this church under the sound of my voice to understand we're not playing a little game. This is very, very serious. It is heaven or hell. It is between, uh, amen, uh, <clears throat> heaven and hell. And the best thing we can do is swallow the gospel hook, line, and sinker. And there's an old saying down where I'm from. <laughs> Aren't we hooked on those old sayings? How many makes your bed? How many changes the sheets on your bed? I guess everybody here does, don't you? Have you ever noticed that if you really make your bed like it's supposed to be, you sleep better? How many has ever tried to sleep and the bed wasn't made right? You know, the sheets got all wadded up and got wrapped around your feet, come loose from the mattress. And in the middle of the night, you didn't feel like getting up and straightening it out, so you just laid there and tossed and turned all night long. The blanket got off of you. You got cold or you got hot. Or... And so somebody come up with an old saying that says, Go ahead, Brother Dharma. You made your bed, now you got to sleep in it. You made your bed. In other words, you created your own problems. By your lack of diligence, by your lack of, of really living for God like you should, families can just fall apart. Children can be angry and mad and upset, or they can be precious children, can be living for God, depending on how the parents work that marriage, you know. You know, if you're going to marry somebody, you're going to have to stay with them. And I don't know why in the world we come up with the idea for better or for worse, it always gets worse. <laughs> Some of y'all don't believe it gets worse. I know that's kind of crude, but the honeymoon is about the best thing you're ever going to experience. You've got to get down to business and, and really work at it and stay in love and get over your little attitude. I'm going to straighten her out. I'm going to straighten him out. I'm going to change her. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of that. You just need to get out and thank God it ain't any worse than it is. But you know, you go to try to straighten it out your husband or your wife. I'm not talking about sin. I'm not talking about adultery, fornication, anything like that because that is inexcusable. But if they repent, we are supposed to forgive. Because there is something important about the bed that we make. The example that we exhibit. I just want to thank God today that I had some good examples growing up. I'm not the perfect individual, but... You know, we all got to have a moral compass. We all got to think, now, what would, what would, under this circumstance, what would this person do, this mentor in my life? We all got to have a little mentor in our life. I don't mean to make everybody, well, I feel a kind of a tightness here. Did I say something y'all didn't like? 
Are you trying to control the pulpit? Are you trying to tell me what I'm supposed to preach and what I'm not supposed to preach? Well, say amen. amen. You're going to make a bed, and it can be very comfortable, or it can be very uncomfortable. Really, honestly, I feel sorry for people that can come to church and look at the preacher and say, well, I'm going to decide what I'm going to think and what I'm not going to think. I'm going to decide what I'm going to believe and what I'm not going to believe. I'm trying to preach to you the Word of God, and it's real important for you if you're going to be a member of this church. To let God help you with your thinking. Our thinking. Our thinking. Because you see, in the bubble in the world, anytime there is an organization, a corporation, a, a religious movement, a uh, gang of thugs, there's going to be a bubble of thinking. And outside, and when you control people's thinking, most of the time you're going to leave out truth. Truth is going to be withheld. Ignorance is going to prevail. You talk about a lot of people in the world, you talk about the inner city bubble. You talk about the Pharisees bubble that Jesus talked about about the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod, the leaven of certain doctrines. I really believe that behind a lot of doctrines there's a demon and there's a spirit. I believe there's a spirit behind the doctrine of Calvinism. I believe there's a spirit behind the doctrine of once saved, always saved. I believe there's a spirit behind Acts 2.38 and it's the Holy Ghost. Amen. And God doesn't suppress the truth. I believe there's a spirit be behind holiness. We need that spirit on us. It's beautiful. Oh, I, I saw a sister uh, on the, I, I saved it on my Facebook page, Sister Shoemaker was singing Lily of the Valley, and she's talking about the day star, and, and the Spirit of God was just moving in that service, and people were worshiping God, and oh, there's such a beautiful spirit behind a woman that knows how to not cut her hair and not dress like a man and not involve herself in the thinking of the world and involve herself in the thinking that we find in the Scripture. The scripture is more important than Hollywood. The scripture is more important than the styles and fads and fashions of Paris that tries to cause people to expose their bodies in public. The scripture is the epitome of the bubble that we need to be in and have that covering that's over us so that when bad things happen, we can still live for God. When we suffer, we can rejoice in the Lord, saying, you know, something good's going to come out of this. How can you defeat somebody that just believes that all things work together for the good to them that love God? You can't. Is that the bubble you're in? That's the bubble I'm in. Amen. Well, we could go on and on and on, but maybe there's someone that has a, a little comment. Or, well, let's go get the dessert. Hallelujah. Yes. Uh, when you were talking about uh, making your bed and lying in it, uh -huh. and it goes along with it. Uh, one of the things that I have written down on this paper, so I'm going to just read what I got and maybe we can figure it out. It says, uh, what exactly does taking up your cross mean if not the consequences of my own decision? Because it's like, you know, I make bad decisions, so I have to suffer bad consequences. So how does that relate to taking up my cross? 
Well, he prefaced it, Sister Ruth, by saying to deny yourself and take up your cross. If you're going to be my disciple, he has to deny himself. In other words, you have to deny things you have been taught that were not right. You have to deny the bubble that you come out of. You can't stay in the bubble that you were born in because we were all born in sin, shaping in iniquity. Amen. But we've got to say, you know, I've got to unlearn some things. <laughs> Be neat if we could just erase the blackboard of our heart and let God rewrite our life. So deny myself and then take up my cross and that would be taking up, I got it now, that would be taking up my cross by not hanging on to what I'm doing to get satisfaction out and it might result in bad consequences. Deny myself and be strong in the Lord. When you deny yourself, you can let God run your life. Because self is the main reason that people don't live for God. Not the devil. The devil don't want you to live for God, but you know, it's, it, the devil's not here all the time, but I'm here. Wherever I go, that's where I'm at, you know. And if you run from your problem, you think you can run, but when you get there, your problem's going to be right there waiting for you. But when you deny yourself, when you say, Lord, teach me. Show me what I'm doing wrong. I pray that prayer quite often. And there's times when he comes along and he tells me what I'm doing wrong. And I'm just so happy that he does. Because I don't want to do wrong stuff. But we got to deny ourselves. Denying ourselves is what we have to do before we take up our cross. Because if you take up your cross and had not denied yourself, you're going to be nothing but a hypocrite. Denying yourself is probably the same thing as repenting. In other words, you get a mind-changing situation where you really become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away and all things become new. Have you ever had old things pass away? The Apostle Paul, the only way he got out of the bubble of Judaism was for God to flatten him on the road to Damascus and knock his eyes out for three days and nights and talk to him and say, are you tired of kicking against the pricks? Are you tired of having a bed that you can't only really sleep in, Paul? Are you tired, amen, of doing it your way? And Paul said, yes, I'm tired of that. I'm going to do what you say. And did he ever make a turnaround? And sometimes that's what we all, we got we to gotta have a very traumatic experience in our life to get us out of this attitude of what's in it for me. Selfishness. Sister Khan, you had your hand up. Yeah, taking on his work. Well, talk to us. Tell us more about that. Our ministry. Work in the church. Seek first the kingdom of God. There you go. Good preaching. That's not because we feel like it necessarily. Not because we want to, or, oh, I can't wait to do something to teach a Bible study, or I can't wait. Usually our flesh doesn't want to do that. We want to do what we want to do. I want to rest tonight. I, I want to, I, well, I don't feel like doing that, but that's denying ourselves and taking. 
denying ourselves. Well, just like Sunday morning. Can I tell you a little personal story about me? I don't want to take any credit for this, but I did obey the Lord. Now, some of y'all are going to not think this is true, but it is true. Uh, <laughs> there are times when I feel like that the devil comes to church to bind us up. You know, that's not really that form. There are demonic spirits that like to come and cause confusion. And just, they can sit on the music. They can sit on uh, the worship. They can sit on the preaching. The devil can show up. And when he does, he can just cause confusion. And there's times I, I well, my, my wife and I, when we first come to Topeka, uh, we were staying in the church over there in North Topeka. And... We could feel the devil in the building, and we couldn't sleep. We felt a troubling in our spirit. We just didn't feel something's wrong, something's not right. I don't know what it is. We go to praying, and we pray, and we talk to the Lord, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord comes on us, and we say, Devil, you're a liar. Where's that come from? We get anointed whenever we start talking to the devil. Now, you can talk to the devil anytime you want to, but when you get anointed and you're talking to the devil, that means he's right there. You can't see him, but you can feel him. And you've got to have discerning of spirits. Amen. And I'll never forget. I just got all enthusiastic and I walked right up on the platform of that old building where we was at for 18 years in North Topeka after the Lord gave me the church. But I was there two years before I became the pastor and, and I just chased the devil out of the building. <laughs> and we felt the peace of God and we could sleep and we didn't have any problems and well, the same thing goes on on Sunday morning. I got to come over here and say, devil, you know, it's really sad that you come over here and you want to steal what I got. It's really petty, devil, of all the things you could be doing out there in Topeka, Kansas, and all the people that you could be messing with. Why in the world you got to come over here and mess with us at the Apostolic Church? Tell me, tell me, devil, why you got to do that? If some of y'all were here, you'd think I was crazy. you think I was talking to myself. <laughs> and when I don't do that, well, Sunday morning, I got up and I had a good prayer at 4 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock, and I had my Bible study, and I was going, laying back down, going to bed, and the Holy Ghost said, you got to go to church and exercise the place. All right. I didn't want to do it. Well, I'm saying my flesh. I was tired. I got a long day ahead of me. I only got about four hours sleep. And I know if I don't get some sleep, I'm going to be tired during church. But I'd rather be tired during church and have a move of God than to be refreshed and it be dead. That's, that's a little part of denying ourselves. I denied myself a couple of hours of sleep. And folks, we did we have church Sunday morning or what? Yeah. Oh, brother, it was good, good, good. You, you like to feel the spirit, huh? Yes. There's a time when it flows and there's time when it don't flow. The devil can stop the flow if, if we let him. We're fighting against principalities and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness and high places. And don't you ever forget it. Just because you can come and feel the presence of God, you don't even realize the price that has to be paid for there to be a move of God in this church. Right. There has to be fasting and praying and battling against demonic powers or we'll be just like the first church of the dead down the street where you can't feel anything. Right. And you can make up your mind what you want. Do you want a church where you can feel God but you've got to fight the devil? Or you want a church where there's nothing going on. That's good. And whatever happens, it's human ability. There's no anointing. There's no singing in the spirit. All right. That's good. I want to fight the devil. It's worth it. Amen. I'm sorry for taking up so much time. Does anyone else have a comment? Brother Jalthius.
It does. There you go. If you don't deny yourself before you take up the cross, it's going to be kind of heavy. You got to deny yourself. Anyone else? Everybody's mind is clear. All right. I think I'm going to buy about 25 desserts, right? Junior. He's the only one to raise his hand over there in that whole section. Right? Anyone else over there? Okay, there's one, two, three, four. Are you going? Five. How many? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Let's stand to our feet, everybody. Oh, Lord, you're so good all the time, every day, every moment, every hour. We thank you, Lord, for being with us here tonight. Let us have some good fellowship. Let us go over to that restaurant, Lord, and find a hungry soul that we might be able to invite to church, Lord. Maybe you're sending us over there, Lord, to find somebody that might want to live for you. Maybe a straying child of God. We don't know. But bless our fellowship, Lord. And bless your children. Bless your people. We thank you, Lord, for this time of fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you.